get started. Hi, everyone. Hi. I'm Pat. Yeah. How, are, how are we doing? It's, it's late. Are we, are we, how's the energy level? Are we, are we feeling peppy? <laughs> All right, excellent. This is what I'd like to hear. I'm here to tell you some stories, two stories, in fact. Uh, the first is a very consequential story with an all-star cast of characters um, and about a group of people who went and built something that would change uh, the next 60 years of history. And the second is not that, it's about me and how I very slowly and painfully learned how to do something better. And the first begins, as many interesting and consequential stories do, in the 60s, <laughs> in Paris, where a group of uh, programmers under the auspices of the United Nations uh, Federation for Information Processing were assembled, and they were tasked with building a programming language. Now, you may recognize some of the names up here. John Backus and Peter Naur designed the, gram the f grammar formalism known as Backus Naur form for this particular meeting. John McCarthy uh, would go, uh, is the, was the author of Lisp at that time and would go on to have perhaps one of the most uh, illustrious research careers ever. Alan Perlis, Van Vingarden, or however you pronounce that, because I have no idea. Uh, there were 13 people in total, though I only found uh, contemporary pictures for a few. Computer science was not even really a discipline then. It was in its infancy at best. But with the benefit of hindsight, we can you know, look past a, across this more than a half a century and see that the people here put down their mark on history. What they designed there over five days in the course of January 1960 was called Algol 60. And Algol is a programming language, not the first, not the last, there was a, a couple of years back, there was a sort of first attempt, and then eight years later, there would be a very controversial second attempt that made everybody really angry. Uh, but it's definitely the most influential of all of the Algol, uh, the, that core Algol family. And though it never achieved any real measure of industrial success, its biggest inroads were in teaching and it was very popular in uh, academic papers as a language for, algo uh, for algorithm description. It's still the most influential language of all time. I would absolutely stake everything on this. Tony Hoare, who's somebody who keeps uh, coming up, uh, Sir Tony Hoare uh, said that Algol 60 was, and I quote, a language so far ahead of its time that it was an improvement, not just on all its predecessors, but on the vast majority of its successors. I mean, these people were seriously ahead of their time. You ever hear that really old and hackneyed joke about the, everybody going out and buying a Velvet Underground album, and then they instantly started, went out and started a band as soon as they were done with the Velvet Underground album? I think it was a little like this. Once people got through the Algol paper, they felt inspired and empowered to design a programming language. So what made this language so consequential. I mean, something amazing that's pro about programming is that it's an endeavor that's entirely human. I mean, the rules of imperative programming aren't like written, you know, in the stars or carved on a mountaintop. We had to discover them all ourselves. Everything that just seems to us nowadays, like, oh, that's just how things are. You know, statements are laid out that way. We use semicolons to delimit expressions. That's, that's just the way things are done. Somebody had to invent that. Somebody had to take, you know, take this little idea they had, and they had to drag it kicking and screaming you know, into the light. I have a few examples of what Algol did. It was the first language to use lexical scope. That is to delimit code into blocks. They use the begin and end keywords, uh, which maybe uh, which many many programming languages have reused throughout the decades. They let you define functions within functions, so functions had associated scope and could look and had a table where you know where values of variables and functions could be uh, recorded and looked up. And that each block could see only a certain subset of all defined identifiers, and uh, only a subset that made sense. 
I mean, and this wasn't, these weren't nearly the only things that Algol codified, but they're the things that are important for what I'd like to talk about today. These ideas have leached out into all sorts of places around the world, but perhaps the most notable is another continent away, 12 years later, in New Jersey, where uh, a couple of programmers uh, at uh, at and uh, Bell Labs, uh, designed a programming language to implement a little-known operating system called Unix. And they called it C. C is Algol's golden child. It, you know, it made its parent proud. It's an out, yeah, and C was an industrial rather than academic product, so it, you know, played fast and loose with some of the lessons that Algol laid down, like all good children. But it also achieved success, you know, just beyond what anyone could ever have expected. It ate the world. Like, you know, you or I or nearly anyone can't go a day, you know, if you live in any sort of uh, remotely populated area, can't go a day without interacting with something that's written in C. I mean, that's pretty amazing. Our phones, our operating systems, the code that runs on our cars and our traffic lights and our electric meters, the firmware and that projector over there, it's absolutely everywhere. C is ubiquitous beyond ubiquitous. I like to compare it to concrete. Sure, you don't want to build everything in a city out of concrete. It gets a little brutal, but <laughs> uh, but imagining an American city without concrete is just, it doesn't even really compute. C is spectacular, a spectacular success. And thus we find ourselves, you know, fast forward a few decades in which nothing really happened, uh, to, the pre to the present day. And the legacy of those, that, like, week, that work week in Paris still hangs over us. The legacy of Algol is everywhere. It's not just in C, though C is uh, probably my favorite of what's up here. Um, <laughs> Algol has influenced absolutely all of the popular programming languages that we use today, all of them. And syntactically, all of these are much more similar than they are different. I mean, we look at languages like J, and Tracy showed us uh, earlier, there's a language that doesn't look anything like what we're used to. It's, and, Indeed, J descended from APL, which is totally unconnected to Algol. But Algol's presence is just inescapable in the modern era of programming language design. And this is cool, but it also kind of bums me out. Because you'd think that with such a rich shared heritage that's well documented and that people care about, people really care about programming languages, uh, you would think that our tools would be a little bit more general, that they would work together, that we would have a suite of tools by now to work with source code, not just one particular language's source code, but just source code that looks like Algol. Let's see. We have tools like grep and sed and awk, and they're fantastic, and they process any text. They, you, know, they, you can expand text with awk, you can substitute it, you can search for things with grep, and you can run your source code through them, sure. I mean, it might work, maybe. I ran uh, Java through the M4 macro language once, and that was, I mean, it did work. What I got was valid Java, but that was, through luck, basically, because M4 is really, really hard. Uh, and then on the other side of things, we have uh, pieces of infrastructure that are super language specific. I think the best example here is uh, libclang, which is a project uh, under the LLVM uh, umbrella and you know, funded uh, by Apple that is the de facto you know, reference and toolkit for working with C and C++ and Objective-C and to some degree Swift. I and mean, this is, a, this is a, a toolkit that knows everything about the semantics of what it means to allocate memory or what it means to you know, invoke a syscall. 
And on the other hand, we have something that just says, haha, it's text. I'm going to do things to it. Is there nothing in the middle that, I mean, that sounds useful, right? If somebody drops a strange config file format that I've never seen on me, and the config file is, you know, 1,500 lines long, and I have no idea what to do, but I know I need to modify every third element in, or third entry in it, why don't we have any vocabulary to describe these sort of problems? And that's the end of my first story. It's not a very happy story, because it's a story about a bunch of incredible computer scientists, and you know, human like us, but, and how they wrote down some really good ideas, and how you know, we, we ran with them in industry and in academia, but we produced a fragmented e ecosystem. Didn't go so good. And this is a good place to start the other story that I t told you I'd tell you. In 2010, I was still an undergrad. I was at George Washington University working uh, with uh, my advisor at the time, Gabe Parmer. And we were working on an operating system. And I don't know if you've ever looked into the code of modern operating system, but it contains a lot of stuff like this. This is a gigantic pound of fine uh, block of an inline assembly that we needed to, in order in this operating system in order to save and restore values from the stack. Now, I don't know if you've ever written assembly, period. Um, a lot of people don't, and you know what? That's awesome. But it's not, it can be fun in a sort of Spartan way, but it's, it's not the sort of thing you want to get up and do every single day of your life. And especially not when you have to embed it inside a gigantic multi-line quasi-terminated string, which goes in one place in your program with a gigantic volatile quali qualifier right, ne right next to it, which is to tell the uh, assembler and compiler, no, please don't move this code. I'm going to leave it right here. Don't optimize it. Don't move it. This gets really, really miserable very quickly. I mean, this, this particular block of assembly works on x86 processors, but what if I have to port this OS to ARM so that it runs on my phone? Or if I want to port it to the Spark architecture, which has um, as many as between uh, 32 and 160 different registers. Uh, I'm not going to write 160 lines of popping and 160 lines of pushing. It's just not going to happen. What I, would, what I really want to do is this, right? This is some Haskell. Haskell is my favorite programming language. This is really the only code I'm going to be showing you today. So you guys can just kind of kick your feet up back and relax. Uh, Here's a set of registers, and I want to for loop through these registers, and I want to say, hey, write a push statement. Then when I'm done looping through these registers, I want to uh, you know, call out to this sys enter, and then you know, at, at the opposite end, once I've invoked my you know, sys call folder all, uh, I want to iterate in reverse and then and it, and emit the correct write instructions and uh, emit the correct pop instructions and this is you know this is essentially a generalized macro system I and mean, if you've ever looked into the, the macros provided by like lisp or julia uh, this is somewhat similar but it's expressed in haskell as a haskell uh, dso Language workbench is a term invented by Martin Fowler, who is a great computer scientist, a great author, in 2005. And I really like this, I really like this term. It's really evocative to me. It brings to mind like, images of tinkering and bringing stuff together and trying things out, of having you know, a set of tools of you know, wrenches and soldering irons and rubber bands and stuff to connect stuff to other stuff. And it brings to mind a spirit of iteration, and that sounds pretty decent, right? A set of tools that we could use to operate on programming languages. And this is what I needed. This is, I didn't want to write another uh, big pound defined macro containing all my ARM code. I didn't want to write a one off programming language. We call these interface definition languages, because that sounds a lot nicer uh, than saying a one-off programming language. I wanted something flexible. I don't, it, it should, you know, it should be, it should have been easy. And so it, with this, you know, dictum in mind, ah, oh, this can't be too difficult. I uh, charged bravely into the problem, despite my threadbare understanding of it. 
Uh, and I, mean, I had great people beside me. I had um, my advisor, Gabe Parmer, and my you know, good friend, Colin Barrett, um, to help me out. And I took a step at implementing a language workbench that could parse, manipulate, and transform C. You can find it on my GitHub. It's called Pony. But I recommend not looking at it. And there's a very good reason for it, and that's because it's not very good. I mean, really not good. It was my first big Haskell project. I didn't really understand what I was doing. I wasn't comfortable with the language. I wasn't comfortable with my problem. I hadn't sat and thought about it for you know, more than a couple months. I didn't provide any tools for working with syntax trees. I expected you basically to bring your own to the table, bring your own and build your own operations on yourself, and maybe Pony would help you out by providing some you know, built-in functions or built-in data structures that represent the common things you encounter across a bunch of different languages. But Jake told us that sucking at something is the first step towards being good at something. And it's so true, because the first version really always sucks. So I tried again. And that's what I'm here to talk about. I'm here to talk about Bracer, which is my personal language workbench implemented as a Haskell library, aimed at, at modifying any curly brace language. I changed the name because around four other open source projects decided they wanted the name Pony. And you know, go ahead. Go ahead. That's, that's absolutely fine. And you can check it out here. And it works a lot better than its previous version did. It's still very pre-alpha. It's, it's still not comf super comfortable with much other than the C at this point. But it makes me happy to look at instead of filling me with crushing despair. <laughs> and this is the crux of my second story that I bit off more than I could chew, and that going back and having put myself into, thrown myself into the theory, uh, having read papers, having read blog posts, having sat inside a REPL and tried you know, hour after hour to see how types fit together. And you know, when I had the free time, when I had the attention span, it's, you know, it's not life gets, life comes at you fast. It's really good at getting in the way, but you know, I t I, over the course of a couple of years, I read when I could, I studied when I could, and I returned to the problem with a richer vo vocabulary. And I hope that my first story, the story about the immense influence of Algol and all the curly brace languages, we end up calling them curly brace languages now, just because that's so syntactically ubiquitous, uh, is, was that this wasn't an academic exercise. I didn't do this because you know, I thought it was just going to be like really cool that I get to play with you know, co-products of endofunctors all day. I did it because I, ne I didn't know how to write good enough Haskell otherwise. Out of a need to manage complex complexity and enable fluency. And I'm, I was almost I was blown away when I finally got my code together and I realized how much easier my life had been instead of harder. I mean, for example, like C is, is small. It's a small language. Many, you can fit it in your head. Many people do. But it's not simple. And the tools that more, quote unquote, abstract functional programming concepts gave to me enabled me to deal with the complexities of C. I mean, like, look at this. Can you tell me exactly what this does? If it, was, if it wasn't written right down there. And the rules for parsing nested function pointers and uh, you know, arrays and uh, the various rule, uh, arcane rules, you know, the, we call them the left-right rule, uh, to read a given C declaration, it's, it's not too easy. But with the libraries that I picked and with the environment that I had assembled, it handled it well. I was able to express the left-right rule for parsing C declarations in pure Haskell and get out something semantically readable and meaningful. And now, as I mentioned, Embracer's a Haskell library. It builds on a lot of other people's code. A lot, a lot, a lot. A very small amount of mine and runs on an industrial strength compiler. And I think there's a misconception when we talk about Haskell projects, both when people outside you know, the functional programming communi community uh, in, you know, indulge in when they talk about uh, typed functional programming. But I think that it's more common than we'd like to admit you know, in, in, inside the community as well. And it's a very myopic notion that you write in languages like F-sharp or Haskell or, uh, you know, or 
uh, Coke or um, Idris, because well-typed program because they give you types, and well-typed programs are really good. And then every, all of the other people who I don't like, they're writing programs that go down here, because they're bad. They're bad. And uh, this is, there's a core of truth in that well-typed programs tend not to go wrong, and poorly typed programs more often than not, and on a long enough time, frail, time scale do go wrong. But it's so myopic as to be just not particularly useful for me. Powerful languages let you make trade-offs. I mean, this is what engineering is about. It's about making intelligent and principled trade-offs in the presence of a problem. Instead of a you know, good to bad spectrum, it's something closer to this when we're talking about power in a given programming language, in a given programming environment with a given set of libraries. I like to think that Bracer is a solution that's very concise and very reusable. Performance is sort of important to me. Programs get very big very quickly, but I, I want concision and, and reusability more than I want any of these. And you know, even I, I I'm willing to relax necessarily expressing certain uh, invariants in the types than I might otherwise, you know, that I might otherwise be able to do if I were to use a more simple, more straightforward approach to solving a given problem. And that's okay. It's okay to relax type safety. That's the point of using a powerful language, is that it gives you choices. It lets you make trade-offs. So what can it do? Well, as I mentioned, it's still in a very, very pre-alpha stage, but it parses and emits all of C99, which uh, it contains some you know, pretty wacky syntactical and semantic uh, warts, shall we say. But it can do uh, some neat stuff. I think syntactic extensions are the things that are, are the, that's the thing that I'm most excited about. Being able to add new keywords, new statements, new concepts to your language on a syntax level, and then have those desugared into whatever boring boilerplate code you're trying to escape, that's awesome. We should all like, seize our programming languages and make them work for us. You could write a custom linter or a hinter. I mean, what's a linter other than a traversal of a uh, C program or of, of a syntax tree that says, OK, this works, or OK, no, your program has a bug. You could use it to write a macro system for any language you wanted, really. In, uh, in bare, you, when writing macros with the pound define mechanism in C, it's really hard not to step on uh, other variables' names because there's no uh, record as to what identifier is in scope that's accessible uh, from the pound define level. So you have to rely on you know, sort of name mangling in your preprocessor. And in, uh, with Bracer, it's very easy to get a variable name that hasn't been used because I keep track of it as, as you go on, as you're parsing and passing through a given syntax tree. And you can, you know, if you want to go you have full absurdity, which is not implemented yet, but by all means, feel free. I mean, you can embed entire many languages inside your, uh, inside your host language and have them compiled down and feed them through a compiler. And so how does this work? I mean, I'm making a lot of claims, and I'm getting uh, close to the end of my time, so I won't uh, go into any huge detail about any of the tools that I use. But I do want to mention them because, they're A, they're a lot of fun, and B, each of them represents something that was absent in my first version, something that I didn't consider, and something that, in letting other people build for me, it just gave me an, an unbelievable amount of expressivity when I'm dealing with real world, you know, the nitty gritty of real world syntax trees and header files. We got to stand on the shoulders of giants, right? And so I stand on three really great Haskell libraries, and they are Lens, CompData, and Trifecta. Fitting like any substantial uh, discussion of lenses into the uh, two minutes I have left to speak is terrifying. and. Uh, just going to, so I have to be extremely brief. Uh, I'd like to give a session on them, uh, hopefully, but uh, for the time being, I'd like to say that Lens is way more than a library. It's its own, it's its own language implemented on top of Haskell. 
It has, it rephrases and reshapes concepts that Haskell gives you so that they all fall under the sort of the lens way. And what it, this means in practice, in the real world, when I'm fighting with you know, a syntax tree that I got out of some header on an open BSD machine, is that I have a vocabulary for talking about any kind of data. Any, um, no matter whether I'm dealing with a Lua syntax tree or a C syntax tree, or even Python, um, or I have the same vocabulary for updating and querying it, these, these syntax nodes that I do in any other environment. And that's just hugely powerful. Recursion schemes. We heard about recursion schemes. Shout out Greg. Where's, where's Greg? Hey, what's up? Um, Greg's presentation was awesome. I really enjoyed it. Uh, the depth and breadth of recursion schemes is astounding. And I found that no matter what you want to do to some code, to a chunk of code, you know, whether it on, it just in pure text form or already as a syntax tree, there's a recursion scheme for it. And renaming identifiers, that's a, that's a traversal. Type checking, that's a traversal. You're converting between re representations, writing out to disk or to JSON, that's a traversal. All of these can be represented with recursion schemes. And, some, and they're so well thought out, and, there are so, and the expressivity is just so beyond anything you can get or you'd even think about getting when writing it by hand. It really changed how I wrote code in Haskell, period. I, mean, I would say recursion schemes are the most important uh, thing that I've learned about Haskell, the things that have stretched my mind the most. Using paramorphisms, uh, which, Greg out, uh, which Greg may or may not have outlined. Nope, no, no, no paramorphisms. Um, a, par a paramorphism is one kind of recursion scheme. And uh, I'm able to pretty print any, a given syntax tree in 100 lines of code, including uh, packing uh, variables correctly. Remember that nasty declaration we saw early? It handles that correctly. Um, it's, tr it's extraordinarily expressive. I believe in the first version, uh, the c I had maybe 500 or 600 lines of code, keeping painful track of all the indentation and dedentation. It was, it was not good. And then I was, come along, I was able to come along and, by factoring out my recursion, yield with so little code I didn't know what to do with myself. I mean, 130 lines of code, is uh, that's... I would have written more boilerplate alone if I was doing this in C++ than 130 lines. Parser combinators are another thing that lies at the heart and soul of Bracer. Everyone's called parser combinators the gateway drug to Haskell, and I'm here to uh, tell you that that is, in fact, very true because uh, it, it happened to me. Parser combinators are a way of expressing a language's grammar, not as a separate language, as what you might be used with to if you've ever done any Lex or Yak or Bison, but in the code of the host language. Trifecta, which is the parser combinator library that I use, goes beyond any of the other competing offers. There's a lot of parser combinator libraries out there because they're because um, it's an exciting space. What Trifecta does, and what enabled Bracer's really only original research contribution, which is that Trifecta recognizes or, uh, represents the capabilities of a given parser, whether that parser is to parse XML or Lua or CSS, whatever, in a hierarchical fashion. If a language is, a, if a parser is able to slurp up some literal values, like you know a million or 3.14 with a character A. Then it's able to. Then it clearly must have, at some point, been able to classify and code, decode and classify its input. We call that tokenization. If it's able to decode and classify this input, then it must have gotten this input from somewhere. It must be able to read character by character. Other parser com combinator libraries, they just give you a big namespace of a flat namespace of uh, various combinators, and they just say, you know, have at it, and that's dope. But when you take into when you give it this uh, rigid structure, trifecta makes 
the following hierarchy clear. And this is what bringing it back to Algol and Algol style languages. Algol style languages maintain, it different, uh, maintain differences between literals, expressions, statements, and functions. Every expression, uh, every literal is an expression. Every expression is a statement. And statements uh, are the ultimate uh, unit of com computation, and they are only allowed in functions. So swapping out, changing the parser of your language is as simple as swapping out one rather than all of these parsers. So I can go in and I can say, all right, I'm going to do some really cool bit masking stuff with my C program, but I need binary literals. And C doesn't have binary literals. All I have to do is, is swap this value, swap this part of the tower out with a parser that supports binary literals expressed as parser combinators, and boom, I have a new language. I have C plus binary literals. And the last thing I believe that I want to talk about is compositional data types and co-products. These are provided by uh, Patrick Barr's uh, by, uh, by Patrick Barr's comp data library. And they enable us to assemble the building blocks of a language in a fashion that's, well, compositional, that we can say, all right, I need literal nodes, I need uh, some expressions here, I need you know, a while loop, I need a for loop, I need keys for that. And we, can exp and we can build up data types to represent a given syntax tree piece by piece, horizontally, rather than all at once in advance. And here's an example, a simple example, but an example nonetheless of such a signature. And this is the whole C grammar. It's literals. We use the, um, this operator uh, to uh, represent the co-product of two functors. And these, all of these nodes are assembled easily. We, and we can say later on that, hey, I need to add the call with current continuation statement to the C grammar, and we can put it down there. And then all of the nodes will be syntax nodes that I introduce with my new addition will, be, will flow correctly back into the C grammar type. And I, this may remind you, actually, of uh, Brian's presentation earlier about active patterns, about saying, hey, here's a type, and it's composed of multiple component types. And so we're winding up because I'm five minutes over. Oh, God, sorry. Uh, I told you two stories today. Uh, one, you know, historical account, very important. One, you know, not so important personal experience. And there are a few things that I hope that you can take away from this. People, as we all know, are way more concerned with differences than similarities. We see this in social interactions big time, but it bleeds over into our attitudes towards our languages towards our tools, and unfortunately towards other people. We get so hung up on the differences between Ruby's small talk style of object orientation and Python's Simula style school of object orientation, or the difference between a Lisp 1 2. And in doing so, we often get into fights and flame wars and make the internet a worse place. But we lose sight of what precious generality we have. And I wish, and this generality exists, though. It's not a myth. And we should ask ourselves, what can we do to take advantage of this? It's very easy to say, oh, well, my program operates on, uh, you know, C99 with GNU extensions and it only works here and it only works with this indentation style if it's written at 2.30 on a Friday. Uh, and that's, I think, not a great mindset to go about the world. If we are able at all to deal with the inertia that comes with huge code bases, and I'm talking, you know, beyond, you know, 1, 5, 10, 15, 30 million lines of code, we need better tools. We need to challenge ourselves. I hope that you can take away that abs abstract or seemingly abstract functional programming techniques made real-world tasks not just possible, 
but easy. They made it kind of go, oh, that's all I had to do? And that they'd work, you know, even when it comes to, that, to the horrible details of how exactly a declarator in C is parsed. It's gross, but these techniques really do work. They're not toys, they're not curios. And the most important thing that I want to take, that I hope that you can take away from this, is that you can do it too. I'm not a type theorist, I'm not a mathematician, I'm an industrial programmer, I got my start writing Ruby and Python, and I went into C, like, I come from doing web apps. And, you know, in, at nights, on weekends, when I had a little while here and there, I didn't have to go to the, you know, I didn't have to go to the mountains to uh, study this. But, and I know that, you know, this is knowledge that's for everyone. And I know that you can do it too. And I think that's it.